reflecting the potential and the actual role for libraries in the holiday activities and food program and just want to say we are recording today so feel free to leave your cameras off if you prefer to we are having several presentations during the course of the hour or the hour and 50 minutes and if you could keep your microphones on mute that would be great during the presentations and we've got some time at the end for speakers to answer any questions so if you've got any questions or any thoughts or comments please just pop them in the chat box um, and if you could preface them by a queue we'll be able to pick them up easily to answer questions and we may ask you to if you're happy to to unmute yourself and ask a question so the reason why we're doing this today was uh, in the Children's Commission report in January 2021, which was called Child Poverty, the Crisis We Can't Keep Ignoring. It highlighted that even before COVID, levels of child poverty in England were getting higher. The COVID crisis has shone a, a light on the sort of realities that translate to that children going hungry and families just struggling by week to week. And as, as we all know, the strains on family life have been enormous and on children and the impact on children's development and their life chances is obviously as a result of that. And we know that school holidays are a particular pressure point for families. So the importance of having those enriching experiences has never been more important. So I'm really delighted today to be working with our partners in Street Games, um, who are part of the Half Coalition, or Half Alliance rather, and um, they'll be talking to us today. So I'm really pleased to be able to hand over to John Downs, who will talk us a bit more about the Half Alliance. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me. I'm morning all. Um... Thank you, Sarah, for the introduction. Um, just, just a bit of background um, about street games and why we're, why we're on this call. And, you know, there's, there's tight time and we can answer questions later. So street games, we're a, a, a charity that work across the UK. And our, our focus is the children and young people living in the, the areas most affected by poverty and deprivation in the UK. And we've been doing this for about 15 years. Now, kind of, I suppose traditionally our, our main delivery mechanism has been sport and physical activity. But over the last two, three years, we've been involved with the half pilots. Previous to that, we've, we set up a campaign about six years ago called Fit and Fed. Um, the idea being that we started to see more and more um, um, reports from organisations and our partners. And obviously there was more research being done about the holiday, holiday gap issue. Um, and the, the school holidays being a pressure time for families. So as a charity, our aim was to mobilise and do something about that um, and to try and work with organisations to, de to develop, you know, really good, enriching, um, fun, active holiday programmes that provide food to young people. Um, and that journey has taken us through the holiday activity fund pilots, which, um, you know, you're going to hear about some examples later on. Um, ourselves, we led... Um, the program in uh, Newcastle for in 2019 and 2020 and we're now working with a number of local authorities across the country to share our kind of experience. Um, I suppose I was asked to just briefly talk about what is HAF you know um, and, and you can go onto the DFE website and you can download um, the, the information and, and you can read what it is. When I think about it you know we, we want to think about what it's got to deliver. It's about providing um, fun, engaging, active holiday provision for young people that gives them a meal while they're there. Um, the, the aim of the HALF programme and what they're trying to do is that they're trying to provide something at Easter holidays, the summer holidays and the Christmas holidays. So a week at Easter is the minimum, four weeks at summer and a week at Christmas. And obviously the summer holidays is coming up and that's the kind of biggest pressure point. Um, and what they want people to provide is, um, in terms of kind of time for young people to engage in activities, it's four hours a day of activity for four days a week of the year for four weeks of the summer. And that's a minimum. It's called the four by four by four guide or rule. Um, and within there, organisations and people providing holiday activities are meant to provide, you know, an hour of physical activity and games, you know. Um, it doesn't have to be pure sport, but it can be for younger ones running around. Um, a, a meal that meets the school food standards. And I suppose where, where you may be more interested today is what they're calling enriching activities. And the idea being it making the, the days that young people are at activities as engaging and fun 
and enriching as possible that helps them, you know, helps them stay, stay, um, stay active, helps them stay engaged with their friends. And I suppose at a time like now is get them ready for um, going back to school in the summer, get them to socialise after periods of long periods of being maybe indoors. And I said, I know that, that, that the young people have been back to school, but through the pandemic, there's been a, a, a bigger a bigger um, drop off in things like physical activity rates and, and young people being able to socialise with their friends. So the aim of the HALF programme is to, is to tackle those, is to tackle the isolation of young people, the inactivity of young people and um, provide them with a, with a meal because that also is something that is missed during the school holidays, especially where the programme is targeted at those children on free school meals. And I suppose from my perspective, I use the word targeted because there is a real challenge with this about the stigma of this program and who is it for. Um, what we've experienced in other parts and seen elsewhere is an open access pro program that is targeted in areas where free school meal children are, are you know, are living, the, the, the areas where the, that percentage is much higher, where you some, some places have 60, 70% of children on free school meals. By targeting those areas, but then not stigmatising it by excluding other young people or making it exclusive, exclusively for those on free school meals. Um, it's targeted at those on free school meals, but there are also many, many other children and young people living in poverty who will be affected over the school holidays and won't be accessing free school meals. So there is a challenge there about provision for the young people and tackling the stigma. But ultimately, when, when, when I think about it and what I said before, it's about a fun, active, enriching holiday programme for young people of all ages between five and 16. And, and therefore the offer of that needs to be varied across the age ranges. And we need to work with a huge range of partners, you know, and, and many of you on the call will be, will be perfect partners to work with to provide um, lots to young people over the summer. So you may not be able to be what will class as activity provider. You may not be able to provide the four by four by four but you may be able to provide some of it. You may be able, to be able to partner up and work alongside a provider locally that can add what you may provide as activities and what will cost as that enrichment part of the program onto, um, onto an existing program that just enhances what is off on offer for young people over the summer. Um, and from the rest of this morning, you'll hear from examples of where libraries have done that in partnership with local providers. And hopefully we can, we can, um, we can stimulate, you know, um, yourselves into thinking, well, we want to be involved in the HALF programme and, and point me in the direction of um, of those local authorities who are running it. And that's the, the, the final bit of this, is that it's been shared, coordinated by local authorities. So in each area, there will be a local authority, on named partner, who will be the coordinating body for the holiday activity programme. Um, so they're the, the key people to, to identify locally if you're interested in, in working in the programme. Um, you know, there's time for questions later. And, and I think, you know, what you'll hear from now is some really good examples of how the how um, libraries have been involved in holiday programmes and the holiday pilots in the past. OK, lovely. Thanks so much, John, for sort of setting the scene there. Um, and yeah, do put any questions in the chat for John and, or, and the others as they go through. Um, I'm delighted now to introduce you to our next speakers so uh, from Redbridge Libraries. Um, Anita Luby is going to introduce introduce the session. Um, so Anita, can I hand over to you? Thank you, Sarah. So I'm going to be talking to you about um, with my colleague Alison Burford, who works in the um, sport and health team for Vision, and we're going to be talking to you about Fit, Fed and Read in Redbridge. So right, I'm going to try and share my screen now. Um, This is where it all goes wrong. <laughs> can you see that? <clears throat> okay. Yes, we can. So, yeah. Fit, Fed and Read in Redbridge is delivered by uh, Vision, Redbridge Culture and Leisure. We are a social enterprise working in partnership with Redbridge Council and we deliver a wide range of leisure and cultural services. Uh, the company is divided into three distinct business areas, which are culture and libraries, which is what I head up, sport and leisure, and the parks and open spaces. Fit, Fed and Read is led by the sports and health team in collaboration with the culture and libraries team. Oh, 
Great, thank you, Anita. Um, I'm Alison Burford, I'm the Sport and Health Manager, and a few years ago I attended a Sport England Leadership Conference and I was talking to a gentleman there in the Parks team who worked for Hertfordshire County Council and we got talking about um, the Fitbit and Reed scheme in Hertfordshire and I really liked the idea. Uh, my team um, already ran a number of targeted projects, weight management, cat crime prevention, but not any holiday camps as this mainly was run by private organisations. I already knew that the Loxford Ward was one of the um, top deprived wards in the country. So I thought, well, if Hertfordshire need this kind of programme, then East London uh, certainly must. So I started a map mapping exercise and talking to different partners of who could be involved. I spoke to schools, public health team, children's services, and just got um, a better understanding really of the need and quickly realised there was a gap in affordable uh, or free holiday provision for children, as well as the huge issue of holiday hunger. Anita and I have worked really closely for a number of years on many different projects, and I really wanted the reading element to be involved, um, especially for the younger children, if they weren't able to read, then more about a, an active story time um, and listening to just books and, and reading uh, alongside someone else, and even looking at just the images. So um, after talking to Anita, sh she also had realised that some of her team within the library service had had these conversations with families that they were struggling during the school holidays and would often use libraries. So we decided that as mums ourselves to, to young children that we wanted to do something, but um, we didn't have any money. So we thought, right, we'll apply for some money and try for a pilot. So our main aims, what we wanted to do was to obviously address holiday hunger, reduce isolation over the school holidays, increase physical activity levels, improve nutrition knowledge of just how to become sugar smart um, and supporting literacy skills through the library service as well. My team were already working really closely with street games on another project and I asked them for some ideas or good practice and again, Hertfordshire project um, popped up. So um, we then decided to apply for some awards for all funding uh, with support from the Street Games and we were successfully awarded £10,000 to start our pilot uh, in the Loxford area um, specifically for children that were eligible for free school meals. And this is pilot is what brought the different partners together offering different skills and supported uh, the project to, to get going. The pilot was open to those that uh, were eligible for free school meals and what we needed or, or what I really wanted was a, a friendly referral pathway similar to what John mentioned earlier that there was there is a stigma attached to those that uh, have free school meals and I chatted to a number of my friends that when they were younger they'd also had it and I really didn't want that for the children I really wanted it to be, to be a positive experience right up, uh, right from the start I wanted them to make the children to be excited to be able to come along uh, and the staff uh, at school School, at the school were really vital in this to make sure that it was positive and therefore we decided to invite these children to come along rather than that they were chosen because they got a free lunch and they're invited um, through the golden ticket very much Charlie and the Chocolate Factory style that um, it's an exciting opportunity to be invited you have the golden ticket so come along to our holiday provision. So, oh, as we've already mentioned, it's uh, Fit, Fed and Read and Redbridge is a collaboration between sports and the culture and libraries team. And um, what that's enabled us to do is to work really, really closely with each other. I think in the past, our, within our organisation, we tend to work in quite silos. Um, so this has been an opportunity to deepen the relationship with our internal partners. Um, and we've been able to basically um, share resources, share um, expertise with each other, build capacity within our own teams and extend the reach of some of our existing programmes. So what we've also been doing is making sure that every child that participated, they join, they, they get joined up to the library, that they can take part in reading programmes, but other activities that other colleagues are running. To deliver a project of the scale that we have been doing um, does require partnership work and we couldn't do this by ourselves um, we just don't have the resource to you know to do this on our own so 
as the project keeps growing bigger and bigger, we're now tapping into other parts of our organisation. I mean, we are very fortunate that we have an in with lots of different colleagues and we're very, both Alison and I are very persuasive at getting people to kind of come along with us. Um, so as the project is growing bigger and bigger, we're, you know, we're able to make sure that those enrichment activities that are really critical as part of the children's development that we can access that from other colleagues so our museums and heritage teams and the drama teams are also going to get involved and we're also going to be working with our colleagues in parks and open spaces to potentially offer bushcraft type activities so um have i jumped to screen um i'm going Sorry, I, I knew you shouldn't have put me in charge of the slides, Alison, going back. So when we started Fit, Fed and Read um, about 18 months, two years ago, we never planned for a global pandemic. Um, so over the last 12 months, we've really had to radically change what we would do, uh, our approach. What we found was um, for the first time, COVID threw many families into the free school meal system for the first time in their lives. So this was all very new to them. Uh, it also meant that there were even more children in Redbridge needing our support during the school holidays. Unfortunately, that first summer holiday, um, our organisation was shutting down facilities. All our 90% uh, of our workforce was furloughed. So we were unable to deliver a program in the summer, but we didn't, you know, this was really devastating for myself and for Alison. And of course, for all those families that were really relying, people were phoning up and saying, are you going to be running this in the summer? Because they'd come to the, um, the February um, session. So Alison and I were like, we really need, you know, we weren't going to just sit back and not do anything. So we decided we would move everything online and uh, go ahead for October. So all our, uh, all the activities moved online. We, each child received book and activity hampers along with food hampers or food vouchers so that the families could buy food to take part in cooking lessons. Um, it's also worth mentioning that when you move uh, your program online, this, it takes as much work as it does to organise a physical uh, program. And careful consideration needs to be given to the safeguarding of children in a virtual setting. It includes looking after their physical and mental well-being. And, you know, we've talked about these sessions are normally four hours long when you, you're meeting them face to face in the virtual environment two hours was about as much as the children could um, cope with. The other challenge with this format is that the children that are living in digital po poverty were excluded from participating in the programme. In Redbridge, there are over 7,000 families living in digital poverty, but the schools that we were working with were really brilliant in making sure that any child that they were, they were referring to the programme, that they also provided them with a a device that they could access the program. Not all schools were able to do this, so it did unfortunately mean that some children still missed out. We're now exploring with the uh, with other partners how we can support those families and petition. And we're kind of looking at a loan tablet program through the library service. So, despite the challenges we had in the online program, participant feedback has been really, really positive from both the children and the parents, with children reporting that they felt far less worried or lonely, and also saying that the program helped them to improve their reading skills, to stay motivated, and to take better care of themselves, and it also helped them to um, it encourage them to have a positive mindset. Thanks, Anita. So during um, COVID, free school meals 
did come to the forefront of many discussions, uh, mainly because of Marcus Rashford and his good work that he um, lobbied to the government to try and support these families and therefore the, the creation of HAF pretty much. So due to the success of Fit, Fed and Read in Redbridge, Redbridge Council commissioned Vision to deliver the HAF Easter programme. Uh, we had seven weeks, which was, which was pretty tough um, to deliver a high quality multidisciplinary ho holiday programme for five to 16 year olds. So all of, us, all of a sudden our age range had doubled because we'd only uh, targeted primary schools before and all via Zoom. So we all had to pretty much become Zoom experts pretty quickly. Um, and this is where the positive partnerships just, just proved to be vital as, as Anita's mentioned. And we went across all of our service areas. So the sport and health team, nutritional experts, libraries, and luckily we have drama, music and theatre services uh, within Vision as well. So again, because Easter, uh, the council decided they wanted, even though restrictions had lifted, they still wanted um, it to be online because a number of parents still had concerns. So we provided each child with a huge food hamper, a healthy recipe booklet um, and cookery lessons. Um, all of this is online so when you see a little child with a knife you do get a little bit nervous but um, we had parents obviously on, on there to support as well. Uh, we provided dance so to increase physical activity lessons through da dance forms and they also had uh, physical activity equipment for example skipping ropes um, as part of their hamper and the focus for, for this group probably is the enrichment activities so primary schools we worked with a local uh, arts club and they provided paints and good quality art and we also had daily story time with a professional storyteller Secondary school, children, uh, secondary school children were a little bit more tricky, so we had to become really creative with the art workshops that we did. We also did creative writing techniques and creative theatre and drama activities, as well as um, them receiving a book that was uh, relevant to their age groups. As Anita's mentioned, there's been a number of challenges online, keeping the t uh, children entertained. Um, we had a huge number of children that registered, but actually, uh, so therefore we had to move more to uh, a lecture theme rather than uh, an interactive approach. There's also still the safeguarding issues with it online that we had to address. And we had 418 children registered, but only 170 attended. And that's mainly because at the same time, COVID restrictions were lifted. So people wanted, didn't want to be in front of screens. They got fed up a bit and wanted to be out and enjoying their time and going to see um, their friends and family. But we had 92% of possible. Uh, participants said they had a positive experience. We increased physical activity levels, increased nutrition uh, knowledge, and children engaged in positive activities that they might not normally engage in. And that was mainly down to the fantastic work of the partnerships that we have within internally and externally that, that we used and came together. So our next steps Sorry, Anita, could you, thank you. Um, we're just waiting for further details from Redbridge Council of how HAF will be delivered in the summer and Christmas. We have um, received some funding from a Tackling Equalities Fund and we will be creating a HAF sports club. So everyone that attended during Easter will now come to weekly sports clubs uh, sessions within the local park. And we're also moving our Fit, Fed and Read to an after school club um, so the children have somewhere to go on a weekly basis that will um, provide them with some food, positive experience and making some new friends, um, not online, hopefully in person. Thank you very much.
All right, so thank you so much for that, Anita and Alison. I really appreciate that. It's a really powerful presentation. Um, just handing straight over now to uh, Jane Shrewing from Street Games and Jane Mellis from Hertfordshire Library to talk about the programme in Hertfordshire. Thanks, Sarah. Sarah. Hi, everyone. I, I'm Jen Shearing. So I'm, I'm actually here on a, a dual role this uh, this morning. So um, as Sarah said, I, I am with Street Games. I recently joined Street Games from the Hulls Partnership, um, and that's the programme that I'll be talking to you about um, now, um, along with um, one of our partners, um, Jane Mellis from the Service, Hertfordshire Libraries. Um, and then I'll also be following up a little bit later from a Street Games pers perspective. So uh, as I say, I'm playing a bit of a, a dual role. Um, but in Hertfordshire, um, as Alison mentioned, we started a programme called Bit Red and Red. Um, it came on the back of the Street Games campaign, which, um, which was launched in 2016. And we had seen the, um, the campaign. And um, exactly as um, Alison said, we, we had a look and thought, does this really affect Hertfordshire? Is this something we should be looking at? Um, when we started to look at, uh, into this, there was 14,000 children on free tours in Hertfordshire. And we realised that there was an issue and that, that we needed to address. Significantly, there's now 23 children, uh, 23,000 children on free school meals as a result of the pandemic. So you can see the growth and the absolute need for this type of, of projects. Um, so Fit, Fed and Red is a whole systems play-based approach. And it's um, to tackling holiday hunger, inactivity and social isolation. Um, it's um, targeted in the areas of, of deprivation across the, the uh, county and it's very much a partnership programme. Um, so we targeted with a nutritious meal, physical activity, but also we felt it important to, to include some support with literacy. Um, as you can see along the bottom of the uh, slide, there is a whole range of partners involved in, in this programme. And that's very much at the core of this, um, of the Fit, Fed and Red in, in Hearts is around uh, a partnership and pro. So really it was started in partnership with the fire list. We, we approached um, the Hertfordshire Fire and Rescue Service about the use of their facilities. Um, so um, initially we started off and it's run out of the fire stations during the Easter and summer holidays. Um, if they take their, their fire tenders out, it, it creates a, a little indoor um, sports hall um, that we've been able to, to utilize. And obviously there's a kitchen and, and an eating area within each of the fire stations. Um, it has been a great attraction for the children and young people um, within the uh, actual fire stations. So that was one of our initial partners to get involved in the programme. We then came on board at Hertfordshire Catering Limited, who are the school food providers for the county. And we're fortunate that we have a county organisation um, uh, within, um, within Hertfordshire who have been absolutely wonderful in providing the school meals um, for children. In the fire stations, they brought them, they cooked them in a school and brought them into the fire station, served them up, and the children and young people got to sit and eat them with the fire, um, the firefighters and any other visitors. We always encourage visitors, whether it be library staff, be firefighters, whoever it is there, to sit and eat with the children at lunchtime because we think it's an opportunity. And then, of course, the Hertfordshire Library Service who came on board and I, I'm, I'm as we go further down this presentation, Jane will tell you more about their involvement, but they have been an absolute wonderful partner to this programme and, and this has made a, a huge difference. Um, so that was sort of the core of our, our partnership. Families first we engage with um, in terms of the referral process. So they work with the most um, sort of the um, most vulnerable children um, and on referral basis into the programme. Other partners have come on board, as you can see, Hertfordshire Golf, the police, Hearts Will Stop, Mind in Hearts um, Network, Mental Health. So it really is uh, what we've been able to demonstrate is a, is a, 
a fantastic scheme that have more and more partners have come to us and said, can we get involved with you, please? Um, and that's that sort of the programme as it is. As you can see, many, many different areas from the fire service involvement, parts of catering from the smoothie bikes um, and some nutrition. But please come along, sports activities and, and the libraries. So we um, ran some pilot programmes um, funded by the uh, National Lottery Awards for All. And we then went on to apply to the National Lottery's Community Fund. And we were fortunate to be awarded um, £470,000 for to run this programme over three and a half years. And what we have is um, six different outcomes which are measured for our funding agreement, um, which is around the holiday hunger, inactivity, isolation, um, the well-being and self-efficacy in young people, um, reducing educational attainment decline um, and increasing families' awareness of, of local provision so we can support them with longer term sustainability of, um, of improved sort of life outcomes. So we, talk, we have a, a programme called Active Local which is our place-based approach to um, reducing inactivity in the most disadvantaged areas. Sorry, I have, didn't introduce my organisation, my previous organisation. We're Heart Sports Partnership. So we are the active partnership for, for Hertfordshire. We're hosted by the University um, of Hertfordshire and we are um, a sort of an unincorporated voluntary organisation funded by Sport England. Sorry, I should have explained that background to start off with. Um, so we have a programme called Active Local, which is our place-based approach. So we have tried to, so initially when we set these up, we, we had one project in each of our local authority district areas. Um, because of COVID, we've had to move venues. We haven't been able to use the fire service because it's not been open to uh, the fire stations, because it's not been open to uh, the public. So it's moved to a, a, a variety of, of venues, um, whether it's primary schools, rugby clubs, adventure playgrounds, um, during and the, as, as things open up um, for, for the summer and going forward, we'll be looking at what one of the most appropriate venues, whether we go back to some fire stations, whether we stay in some schools, clubs. Regardless of the venue, the programme remains the, the same. Um, I'm now going to pass over to, to Jay, who can talk you through the role of the, the library service um, in, in Hertfordshire. Um, and then I'll... I'll just sum up it at the end of that. Thanks, Jane. Thank you, Jane. Okay, so um, I'm Jane Mellors from Hertfordshire Library Service, um, and I'm Senior Librarian for Children and Young People. And as a library service, we're extremely proud to be part of this, what is a multi-award winning programme, Fit, Fed and Red. This has been very much our priority in our library service plan since 2018. And we've built a really strong partnership with Heart Sports Partnership, learning, reflecting, and building on the experience of each of the programs that have been delivered. In 2020, despite the challenges of the pandemic, all partners involved pulled together, and really at the last minute as well. And they worked really hard to ensure that the program was delivered to those children most in need across Hertfordshire move to the next slide thank you so how do we de deliver the red part of fit fed and red so two of our service development project librarians are assigned the project and their brief is to liaise with the heart sports partnership on the practicalities such as the specific um locations um and the um the, the agree the timetables um, and the equipment and resources that are required. And as Jane pointed out, the locations have varied. We started off in fire stations and latterly, we've now moved to schools and sports centres. And um, the role of the librarians is also to liaise with um, the local staff in libraries and the area teams around the staffing of the sessions and to provide staff with training and support before and during the programme. In 2020, as with all libraries, staffing was really uncertain and right up to the last minute, due to the shielding um, of staff, low staffing levels generally, and also being at the early stage of service recovery. However, I'm proud to say that half of the sessions that were delivered were fully supported by library staff, and the remaining sessions without library staff were provided 
with support materials to enable delivery by the sports coaches. Our project librarians are the creative minds who design and develop the session content. And they also contribute alongside other partners to additional content for the work booklet that each child is given at the sessions. Our team are passionate about books, reading and libraries and determined that the content of all the sessions convey this and that they are above all accessible to all children, regardless of abilities or interests. We've learned that the importance of developing sessions that don't rely upon children having knowledge of specific books. We never make assumptions. For example, despite its popularity, not every child has read Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and only some may have seen the film. However, sessions we deliver aim to be fun, varied and appealing. And uh, the librarians have developed sessions that use story cubes and then have enabled children to design their own story cube. And similarly, a session around Tom, top Trump's cards. We've also highlighted specific genres of stock areas, such as information books and developed a fact file session. Also, we focused on visual literacy with a session using picture books. Sessions also include drawing and design elements as well as writing. It is important though to emphasize there is a clear literacy element to all the sessions and we don't want to compromise this. We do acknowledge that some children, particularly during 2020, had very little formal education. Many hadn't picked up a pen or written for months. So for many children to pick up a pen, draw or write their name was and is a real achievement and really important to acknowledge through praise and encouragement. If you can go to the next slide, please. This is very much a partnership between library staff and sports coaches. Library staff from 10 areas deliver alongside the sports coaches an hour slot once a week through the holidays in the summer um, and for four slots in the summer and two at Easter. While many of our staff have been used to delivering chat book sessions with children who already have an interest in books and reading, some did find Fit, Fed and Red more challenging to deliver. However, we have developed staff training before the delivery of the program and use staff feedback to inform what further training and support is needed. For example, the, the sports partnership provided us some behavior management training for staff, which has helped to build staff confidence um, working with the children and also highlighted the important role the sports coaches play in supporting the delivery of the library session by being positive role models and working alongside the children. In previous years, at least one of the sessions has taken place in the library and the Heart Sports Partnership have helped to transport the children to the library. This has given them the opportunity to explore the library and join, borrow books, sign up for summer reading challenge and even try out the equipment in some of our libraries with creator spaces. 2020 meant this was not possible, so we worked around it by bringing the library to the children. A fun introductory video to each session was created and filmed in the library setting. These video guides were used by, by both library staff and sports coaches who delivered sessions in the absence of library staff. And the sports coaches, um, and we, we built on the success of this approach at Easter by delivering even more creative and engaging content. Where it's possible, library staff will showcase books and encourage visits to the library and sign up to the Summer Reading Challenge, of course. In 2020, we were able to gift books for the children to keep um, using the Book Trust Care packages. The children were so excited to receive their own books to keep. For many, they had had few books at home. And I think this slide captures the moment perfectly. At Easter, we were able to gift the Book of Hopes, a lockdown anthology with contributions by a host of top authors and illustrators. And in one of our sessions, one of our more experienced members of staff took the opportunity to read from the book at the end of the um, normal library session, which held both children and sports coaches spellbound and really demonstrated the real magic of books. Success of the programme depends upon everyone having buy-in. All the sports coaches attend a briefing meeting, which was online in 2020, and that's an opportunity to run through what the sessions are covering and what our expectations are regarding their role in the sessions. We know that they will have the opportunity to build up strong relationships with the children over the programme, and therefore we emphasise that by them taking an active part in the sessions, they are a positive role model, an advocate for the library and reading for pleasure and will influence how children engage with the activity. 
The same clear session plans we provide for staff in addition to the video clips are provided as part of the training for sports coaches. While we would always aim to have library staff delivering all library sessions, 2020 has taught us the benefits of skilling up sports coaches to, if not deliver, but actively support the sessions. However, we acknowledge that some um, coaches don't have teaching experience and aren't competent as delivering as others. And so therefore we're looking at providing some additional training support this summer. Moving on to the next slide, please. So measuring success. Measuring success for us is clearly linked with listening, reflecting on what children, families, sports coaches and library staff think of each aspect of the library sessions and then striving to do even better next time. I think it's important to highlight that FitFed and Red has not only impacted on the children that attend, but also their families. And here's just one example from the focus group feedback in 2019 from a mother of a young carer. I think it's pretty powerful stuff. We seek feedback from the children after each session and we make it easy for them using a simple emoji sheet with room for comments and drawings and we take them in account when developing the next session plans. It's interesting that the sessions that the children enjoy most are not always those that the adults think are more popular and it does also vary from group to group. Sports coaches have the opportunity to feedback their thoughts about the sessions at any point during the programme and through the final evaluation. This is useful in developing future training support and building confidence all around. Our staff get to formally feedback how each session went, comment on the content and assess the level of engagement from the children. This informs our final evaluation and recommendations going forward for the next programme. It's important to acknowledge that our staff find Fit, Fed and Red really rewarding an opportunity to share their enthusiasm for libraries and, read, and reading and be part of a program that makes a real difference to children's lives. The great advocates of the program, sharing their enthusiasm and learning with colleagues through conversations and articles in staff newsletters. For them, the biggest reward is when children visit the library. They also tell us what works well and what not so well, so enabling us to fine tune and provide further support. Finally, for us as a library service, success is measured by the very fact that this programme enables us to promote reading for pleasure and deliver over summer and Easter fun literacy activities to nearly 200 of the most vulnerable children in our county. We would struggle to reach these children in any other way, so it's a unique opportunity. The 2021 Active Local Strategy, focusing year-round staff in targeted areas, means that there are more opportunities for libraries to work in partnership year round, helping to build more resilient communities. Thank you for listening. Thanks, uh, thanks Jane. And I, I just think it's just the, the enthusiasm and the engagement from the library staff has been absolutely amazing. And, you know, when we, when we took on this sort of literacy element you know we're all coming from a sports background and took on this literacy element thinking well, actually you know it's this literacy by stealth within our our programs um, and never did we imagine the um as i say the enthusiasm that the libraries have put in always looking at different ways to make the sessions enjoyable for the kids and integrate with the with the children and young people and um uh, you know and it's been an eye-opener i think for the staff on the program the sports coaches how exciting libraries actually are. Things have moved on a lot in there. Uh, and, you know, I don't think we always appreciate that, um, you know, how, how things have changed. You know, we, we think back to the libraries or, or the ones that I took my children to and just some of the working the Lego and all sorts of different opportunities. I just think it is, has been a wonderful partnership. And, um, you know, it's something we're, we're very keen to continue and we're very grateful to the library service for, taking such an interest and um, and really sort of pushing forward with this program. Thanks so much. Thanks, Sarah. Oh, thanks so much, Jane and Jane, for that really, really fascinating and really detailed look at what, what you did. Um, it was really interesting. I'm going to move, we've got some a few questions coming in, but I'm going to move us straight on to our final speaker uh, from the libraries, who's Chris Myhill. And then after that, I'll be sort of drawing all together all the other questions for a, a quick chat afterwards. So Chris, can I hand straight over to you, please? Hi everyone, um, you'll be delighted to hear I don't have any slides, 
Um, so I'm just going to talk to you um, this morning about Gateshead Libraries um, in the northeast of England and our contribution to the Holiday Activities and Food pilot programme back in 2019. So the opportunity to take part came to the council at fairly late notice um, and the library service were asked to take part and it was very much, yes, let's do it. How do we do it? There isn't really anyone to ask. This is very much a pilot. Let's just get on and do it. Um, it was a small part of a programme that ran right across Gateshead and across the whole of Gateshead, 11,200 places were offered, which I think is quite astonishing and 10,800 of those places were actually filled. And they were filled by 2,020 children across Gateshead. That was obviously not all delivered by the library service, um, heaven forbid, but by over 30 um, council organizations and also community groups. So it was a fantastic program brought together at very, very short notice um, right across the borough. And that was managed by the council's neighborhood management team who pulled all of that together um, and helped it to work. The food for the programme was um, delivered and prepared centrally and given out to all of the separate venues. So we didn't have to worry about the food. All we had to worry about was how we were going to deliver this and who we were going to deliver it to. And one of the things that I was really keen that we did was to understand why we were doing this programme. So what was the, why did we really need to reach out to these families? And I was really keen for the staff who were going to deliver it to have an empathy for families who were living in poverty. And I had read a, a very, very moving blog by the Scottish comedian, Jamie Godley, which some of you may have read her book, which is very moving. And she talked in that blog about being hungry as a child an awful lot of the time. And she also talked about going to school in her mother's slippers because she had no shoes. And it was just one of those blogs that really, really touched me and really made me have a, a deeper understanding and empathy towards people who have very little. So it was with that in mind that we set off to deliver the programme. Like I say, we had no idea what to do or how to do it. All I knew was we needed to reach families that we didn't normally reach and that we needed to offer a programme that was different to what we would normally have offered. So we approached our local schools um, and asked their parent support workers which families in your school would most benefit from this programme. And they provided us with a list of names um, and contacts. And we used the golden ticket approach that someone mentioned previously. And that worked really well. We asked the families to ring the library. And when they rang, we made sure we had the right person taking those calls to engage the families with what was going to be a really exciting program. Because we had very clearly in our mind that there are barriers to engagement for families who don't normally use libraries. Just getting those families across the doorstep can be a real challenge. So we were very mindful of that. But anyway, we, we advertised the programme, we gave out the golden tickets and the response was phenomenal. Within the first day or two, all of the places were booked and we were set to go. We then had to sort out a programme. So what did we do? So we spent the money on things that we would never normally spend the money on. So we hired lots of fancy dress costumes, we booked a 10 pin and bowling alley, we booked a glitter tattoo artist, we hired some um, Nerf guns so the children could play Nerf balls. All of those things you would never expect to find in a library. And we were very fortunate in that we do have a very large um, exhibition hall, which we were able to use. So we set about delivering the program. It was absolutely crazy, absolutely crazy. Um, in a fantastic way, it was joyful, it was exciting. But underpinning all of that, we had those um, objectives in mind, which was we were very keen to encourage parental participation, to help support speech and language development, and to promote reading for pleasure, all in an, a non-overt way. So all of those things were happening without anyone realising they were happening. Um, we just went for it big style. 
we didn't really know how it would work um, and it absolutely worked like a dream. We had no behaviour problems with the children. We managed to find things that would engage the parents. So we did surprise some activities specifically for the parents. Um, we provided food for the parents as well as the children. And the thing you also need to bear in mind is you may have the funding for the food for one child, but that family may have four children that you don't have the funding for. So are, have you thought about feeding everyone who comes along? You can't give food to one and not to everyone who's there. So there were lots and lots of things um, to think about. The skills of our children's library specialists were key. They are used to working with children. They are used to working with families and all of their skills absolutely enhanced the programme. But I think what I just need to tell you more than anything was it was absolutely joyful to see those children having that much fun, to see the parents engaging, to hear the squeals of delight and laughter, to build, you know, to play Nerf Wars in a room full of children, to build walls with cardboard boxes, to do junk modelling. We had a ball. I have to say it aged me about 10 years, <laughs> I'm not going to lie, because it absolutely did. It was exhausting. Um, and at the end of every day, we did a staff debrief and I fed them cake and coffee and, you know, tried to bring them back to life. But the team were absolutely amazing. Um, feedback from all of the families was wonderful. And we managed to hang on to those families. So they were families who would never have visited but they visited then and they carried on visiting, which really for us was absolutely wonderful. What I have got to show you is um, a short film put together. It's really just photographs, snapshots of the day put together into a short film. But I think what, I, what it highlights is, is that by thinking creatively and, and outside the box, I know that is a cliche, but trying to deliver something that maybe libraries wouldn't normally deliver, you can still slide in all of those things that you do want to deliver without anybody really noticing that you're doing that. So you can slide in the digital skills and the reading for pleasure and all of those things that libraries are key to helping deliver. So I'm going to show you the film. Um, I'm very happy at the end of this um, presentation to answer any questions when Sarah brings that in about the practicalities. But if I show you the film, hopefully that will get over to you the joy of what we did. So now it's down to the technical challenge of, is this going to work? Let me see.
I hope that gives you a little bit of an idea of what a fantastic, fantastic summer it was. Obviously, summer of 2020 wasn't quite the same. We did deliver something, but obviously nothing like that. And 2021 is in the planning. But if we can enjoy it as much as we did in 2019 and reach as many families who really, really need that support, then we will be very happy. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Chris. That was your your sort of passion for it came through and the grey hairs aren't showing at all. So thank you so much. And thank you so much for sharing that. And thanks to all our other speakers this morning for sharing some fantastic ideas and some fantastic thoughts. We're going to move straight into the questions because we're conscious of time and, and making sure that we finish on time. Um, and there are some kind of general questions that are coming in. We've got Emma with us, Emma Braithwaite from the Reading Agency. And one of the questions that's been asked um, a, a couple of from a couple of the speakers is is around how the universal and the targeted provision fit together. Emma, I don't know if you wanted to say anything about that before I think bring the other speakers in. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as we've seen in some of the presentations, I think um, the summer reading challenge is a, a perfect fit for for the half provision. Um, I think it was uh, somebody said right at the beginning about that kind of uh, not having that stigma at, attached to being involved in something like this. And I think that's the perfect thing with the summer reading challenge. It's open to absolutely every child. Um, you know, run run right across the the country. Um, so yeah, I think that that can work really well. And it's you know, it's fun and it's free and it's addresses that summer literacy dip um it's all about reading for pleasure um and i think the you know the the nature theme we've got got going on this year um is an even better fit uh, for some of the kind of outdoor activity going on but yeah i think that's how the sort of the targeted and the universal can blend together really nicely with with summer reading challenge thanks emma um chris or anita or jane have you got any thoughts about the universal and the uh targeted going together I think it's quite an easy fit, Sarah, to be honest. I think, I hope that film showed that really you can bring in everything you might want to deliver across the summer as part of your wider offer. You can just fit that into your half programme. It isn't really a problem as far as I can see. Brilliant, thank you. Um, totally agree with what Chris says and actually across all the activities that we did you know we hit all of those universal offers um, for us it was we knew that um, keeping children reading during those holiday months was really key uh, and making reading really exciting um, and we also recognize that there are some children you know for, for some of them it, reading is hard and they don't have anybody at home to read to them so for us also having that element of library staff reading to them and also professional storytellers coming in and really bringing books alive for them was uh, was critical for us uh, uh I think what's come out really strongly actually is that that importance of that sort of, you, st uh, you started right at the beginning about talking about the non-stigmatizing and making sure that universal offer was there for everybody. Um, I've got a question for um, everyone who's spoken from Alison, Alison R. Alison, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? <laughs> I will do. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering really, are the, for, for everyone that's spoken, um, are the staff time that's involved to plan and run all of those sessions is that covered by the half funding or or other funding or do the library authorities kind of um absorb some of those costs i think in in, in hertfordshire it's been absorbed by the library service um as part of their partnership approach to this there is however through the half funding um more funding that's available so it's, it's about working with the coordinators and or um, the deliverers to see whether there is any funding that can be allocated to the support from the library services part of the HAF programmes because there is more funding and it is an outcome and in terms of the um, enrichment activities. Mm, okay. um, from our point of view, um, there was some funding for backfill. We didn't employ anyone specifically. The programme was delivered by our in-house team but there was some uh, amount of funding for project management and some backfill. Um, 
In, in Redbridge, for, for the initial phase of the programme, we just absorbed it, the library costs from, because um, the funding that Alison got was, you know, it wasn't huge. But for this Easter programme, we, because we were asked by the council to kind of put something together very, very quickly, we made sure that all our costs in the library service were covered. Um, so, you know, and that was something we weren't used to doing. It, so it was just quite revealing, actually, the amount of support that we do give as library services that has a real cost attached to it that we don't often charge anybody else for but when you put it all down on paper it mounted to tens of thousands of pounds yeah wow thank you um there's a lovely comment on the chat from Stephen Walters his Chris's manager Stephen do you want to just unmute yourself if you're there uh, yeah, yeah I can do yeah, thank you <laughs> I was just I was just enjoying your comment do you want to say a little bit more about that uh, I suppose we're always trying to reach a new audience and it's not always easy mm -hmm. but it was the golden ticket approach and honestly it was a jaw-dropping summer it really was where you you it's, it, it's, it shouldn't maybe I shouldn't say this but you just you just had to look at the families to know you were reaching a, the right audience and it was just the, the the way that Chris managed to blend just sheer summer joy with covert brilliant educational content ah it was it was yeah it disturbed my office no end but <laughs> yeah Job oh, done. I, I love that a jaw dropping and, summer <laughs> yeah I, but I think it is also interesting in Gateshead we are shifting the challenge is moving away from having in total resources for a universal offer to everyone and we're not shying away from no we're targeting people and we haven't got money for everyone but no, we're quite comfortable with that. And I know that is a challenge in thinking, but I think that is that is the direction of travel in Gateshead. Mm. We won't shy away from targeting. Mm, that's interesting, really interesting. Thank you for that. Uh, the, the other question, there are a couple of questions. One's about secondary age pupils and one's about um, how do you get children to join the library? I think, I wonder if we could take those together. One about... It, I, I know that um, you were talking, I think, in, in was it half, no, it was Redbridge about engaging with secondary age people. So, um, and then just how, how that, how that joining the library process works. So, um, Anita and Alison, do you want to say anything about that? Do you want to go first, Alison? Yes, certainly. We, um, it was the secondary school children that proved more challenging of what they would like to do. Um, primary school, you can give them some glitter and off they go you know it's very much about art crafts building with primary school children um so for the secondary school it was thinking slightly differently and actually getting them involved uh, within their creative writing uh within their storytelling and actually acting that out we also incorporated how to create a podcast in there as well um and also kind of theater skills and improving their presentation skills for the older children children so it's all about uh, and we actually asked the older children what they wanted to do uh, so once they'd registered we gave them a choice as well um, because we didn't really know what they would be interested in whether it be coding computing um, IT skills um, so I think it's really important to kind of get those teenagers co-designing of what they want to do mm. so ensure that they stay involved uh, for this summer we're looking at trying to do some accreditation courses whether it be the from my side of things the royal society of public health like health um champions or looking at a volunteer program that they can get involved in and and helping out with the younger children as well so i think it's ensuring that they're learning something and want to come uh, and get something mm. from it yeah, thank you. And John, I think John, John, you had a thought as well. Yeah, yeah. I think ultimately, with across the whole of the half program, the teenage years, the 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 twelve to sixteen group is the is the is the biggest challenge. And when you look um, across the data of all the half pilots, it's very very small. Um, so to 
to it, it's it almost needs a, a kind of a completely separate think about the older age range in terms of what what we've seen for the primary age range in terms of you know drop off come to a kind of activity program a venue and take part in activities on site is can be more directed and as you go up through the age ranges there are some there are you know some young people will be interested in you know particular types of activities but the kind of levels of interest and breadth of interest and friendship groups and all the stuff that happens within a teenager's life suddenly adds in a whole range of extra challenges um so we're finding kind of much more of an outreach approach instead of instead of expecting the age of young people to come into provision how do you go to where those young people are or existing settings so the challenge here is is about so maybe youth providers who are doing something how do we go out you know, in terms of the 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 the, the, the activity that the call has got to offer, how do they, they go out into the hands of partners who already have that relationship to engage with people? If we're trying to deal with a a, a, a bigger scale of twelve to sixteen year olds, mm. then it, it's it's a much more focused outreach program. And in Newcastle last year, we did a specific detached and targeted outreach program for twelve to sixteens, and we managed to get about twenty five then the total um program between 12 and 16 which was a huge increase from the previous year when it's just if you just leave it to plan what a lot of people do is is naturally navigate and gravitate towards the younger age range gravitate towards the kind of primary school age range so it needs a a very different setup at the secondary age um and you know a kind of working with a different range of partners to engage with those those people Thank you, John. Anita, did you have anything to add to that? No, I was just going to add around how we made sure that children or young people were joining the libraries as part mm -hmm. of the overall programme. So when um, children, when the families came to collect their hampers, they the libraries were used as a central point. So we used them to um, pack up all these hundreds and hundreds of bags of hampers and create uh, activity packs but then they came to the library the library staff chatted to the families and said are you a member of the library or uh, you know and they joined them up there and then um, the children then got you know we had all these books that we were gifting to them they got they they were um, from the Redbridge Children's Book Award sh shortlist that so they've been chosen by young people and children in Redbridge so the children were able to choose which book they wanted to take home with them so it was really you know making sure that they knew that the library was a space for them to come any time you know it wasn't just that they were coming there to pick up this pack that it was actually a resource for them and their parents to come back to mm, well, yeah thank you thank you very much um jane from street games you had some reflections about uh, libraries and and the half program do you want to just share some of those yeah i i just think this you know it's a great opportunity for libraries to engage with the most disadvantaged children and provide those opportunities um, and it, it is an, an area that, that I think libraries can really make a difference. I think you know there is some real uh, fantastic and varied skill sets and it's about joining up and, and making that partnership working um, so that we can all bring to the table our, our skills that we've got. I think the use of library venues this summer as the starting things are starting to open up um, in terms of having libraries as a host venue for some of the half programmes. It doesn't necessarily just have to be for visiting um, as part of the programme. But I think where value has, has been shown is, is about taking children to the libraries, whether that be to host a half um, programme during summer. Um, I think there is, there's also um, the training that's available um, street games do training, but I know there's you know local authorities and, and there are a whole various of training uh, um, available as well. And I think that's been valuable um, that we've seen across different programs um, where it doesn't necessarily fall currently within the remit of, of some of the the libraries and and um, you know with sort of challenging behaviour or older young people or some of those. Um, areas that, that actually it's not traditionally been part of a, a library staff's training might be um, beneficial. 
Um, but I, I really think in terms of if, if nothing else is done, it's trying to coordinate, it's trying to link the half with the summer reading challenge because mm. it gives a, an opportunity of resources um, that, that hopefully the children and young people can take away with them and achieve something over the holidays. Uh, you know, uh, many of these children are not ones who, who have certificates and badges and everything that they've been able to achieve because they've not had access to, to the extracurricular activities. Mm -hmm. So the value of these children achieving something over the summer holidays um, can't be under underestimated as well. But, uh, but I would just say, I think there is a will um, from all sorts of organisations to come together and, and partner. And um, I really would, um, you know, encourage the library services up and down the country to, to take that opportunity, because um, I think it will really be to the benefit of those young people that, that need it the most. Brilliant. Thank you Thank so you. much, Jane. And um, just, just a comment, of, since we're talking about Summer Reading Challenge, from Emma about volunteering. Emma, do you just want to... Yes, um, we just, when we were talking earlier about uh, kind of older children and, and young people, um, yeah, just to sort of bear in mind Summer Reading Challenge volunteering opportunities as well for those children. Um, we know they're a great support for library staff, but also the younger children really like kind of working with, with the teenagers and, and doing stuff with them and, and volunteering can be used towards other accreditations they might be doing like Duke of Edinburgh um, and a host of other things that's so yeah worth bearing that in mind as well I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Emma. Um, well, it's 12.15, so um, we're, we're going to close the session now. But I just wanted to say a huge thank you to all of our speakers, to um, to Anita and Alison from Redbridge and from Chris from Gateshead and from Jane and Jane from, from Hertfordshire and also from, from uh, Jane and John from Street Games as well and Emma from the Reading Agency. So really appreciate it and all the questions. We'll try and if then if we haven't answered the questions, we'll try and, and get those answered. Um, we have recorded the session as well so we you please feel free to watch the session again we'll be posting it onto our youtube site as soon as we can do that um I wonder if the speakers don't mind hanging on after the session we'd just like to have a quick debrief but um for the rest of you thank you so much for coming and thank you for participating today all the all the wonderful questions as well and any that we haven't answered we'll try and find a way of answering so thanks again mm -hmm.